This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. As someone who loves browsing the web, all too often I am reminded of why I also despise browsing the web. It's swarming with surveillance, web limitation, and data mining all happening without you even knowing, probably happening right now. No, don't look directly at it, that's how it gets stronger. But with Surfshark VPN, you do have an easy one for all solution. And across many different products as well, Windows, Android, or Apple, with the click of a button, Surfshark turns you into an anonymous and hard to track user, giving you more freedom on the internet, keeping you away from prying eyes, and preventing companies from doing things like geo-blocking, where video and streaming services limit your library simply because of where you live. With Surfshark, you can make all that a non-issue simply by starting up their service, choosing your location, refreshing the page, and there you go, your favorite show that you couldn't watch before because you committed the crime of living in a different country. How do you live with yourself? And those that use the link in the description below and enter the special code Johnny will not only get 83% off their initial order, but the next three months are also completely free. Well, thanks to Surfshark VPN for the sponsor, and thank you as always for helping support this channel. Now sit back, relax, let's continue on with the show. Nope, your eyes do not deceive you. I have spent the last couple of days in Hawaii to play Sonic Frontiers. Ain't that some shit? <laughs> but I know some of you are only interested in the nitty gritty, my first impressions of the game itself. So for you guys, I'll leave a nice little timestamp here. Skip right along uh, to get to the game itself. We won't be taking too long to get there manually. I'm gonna give some proper context for what's happening here. But I know some of you are only interested in the game, so there you go. But to elaborate, to give the context for what's happening here. So around this time ago, uh, say two weeks to a week and a half, it was a very quick turnaround. I was contacted uh, by the social media manager, Acadia from Sega of America, and uh, eventually Evan, who booked the whole thing. They asked if, would you be interested in going to Hawaii to play Sonic Frontiers, to attend the Sonic Frontiers preview event with a uh, bunch of other like gaming press or maybe other content creators. And uh, they gave me the dates and I was like, that's, that's only a few days away. And Lord knows I'm already getting distracted enough, you know, <laughs> getting my Donkey Kong 64 video ready. It's like, some of you guys probably saw this video. like, man, this guy's stalling his ass off <laughs> getting this Donkey Kong 64 video done. But a uh, quick update on that. The game is fully recorded and I'm working on the, the video now, but again, it's gonna be a little more, all requires a little more patience. But go back to the game or the event itself. And if it's not obvious enough, I'm not scripting any of this. I'm just kind of uh, winging it. I don't know when I'm ever gonna get another chance to go to Hawaii. So yeah, why not? It's a free trip to Hawaii. The, all the expenses were paid for this one. This, this, is, this is the total antithesis to the, the LA trip I attended for the Sonic 2 movie premiere earlier this year. You know, there was no Spirit Airline bullshit. It was, it was a relatively comfortable. The only downside was, you know, the, the flight times and the layover. It was like, it takes like 12 hours total, including layovers to get from the East Coast all the way to fucking Hawaii. Cause that's like, that's way out the mainland so far that uh, you're six hours behind the East Coast. And that was probably the biggest challenge for me was just my body adjusting to being six hours behind. Like this goes beyond West Coast, baby. <laughs> this is so far, but I don't know when I'll ever get another chance to visit Hawaii. So that's why I took it. And it was a relatively comfortable flight. We uh, we were stationed at the station in the fucking military operation. Uh, we were spending the, our days in, uh, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce any names here. It's not terribly familiar with Hawaiian culture. I think it was a Moana, a Mo Mauna, Mauna, God damn it. Ma <laughs> Here's the name, damn name. <laughs> you guys tell me how it's pronounced. I think it's a Mauna Kea a hotel resort. Now this was located uh, in Kona. And this is the largest island of Hawaii. Like I think it's like in the, 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 the most Southern island that you can get. Cause we, we were not in like the residential areas. We were not in Honolulu. That's where like all the, that's where the city is at. No, that's where all the people are. Kona is relatively untouched. Uh, and that was like the most remarkable thing, like driving down all these, like, that, cause that's all it is. It's just, a, it's just roads with maybe the occasional like hotel thing here and there. But it was just, it was just untouched land as far as the eye could see if these natural rocky formations uh, formed by years, decades, maybe centuries of volcanic activity. And it was just mesmerizing. And man, I never saw anything like that up close, like outside of movies and shit like that. This, I'm actually looking at untouched Hawaiian islands that you, you only see in the movies and all sort of thing. But that was probably the, the, the best thing about the trip was just getting to bask in. I mean, obviously, yeah, you got the beaches and those were beautiful too. I'm not really a beach guy though. I'm the kind of guy that wears fucking sneakers and socks to the sands, <laughs> not really wear sandals at all because I don't really care about the beach. I don't like going into the ocean water and because uh, I'd rather just sit on the chair and 
enjoy my time. The resort itself was nice. Uh, they gave me a nice little uh, fruit tray, a welcoming coffee basket, and I was like, I think it was okay. They didn't have creamer for the coffee though, so it was, uh, I don't usually drink my coffee black, but you take what, I even pay for it, so whatever. <laughs> the entire stay was around three days. Uh, the event itself was on a Tuesday, and that was pretty much the, the entire focus of it. Like outside of that, we, we, we attended a couple of dinners. Uh, I was, uh, I attended a luau, which is a nice little like buffet with, with a show. And it was really nice. It was very, uh, it's kind of hard to put into words, but it was, it was captivating. It was exciting to see these guys celebrate their culture, give us some historical context to the islands of Hawaii and all that. Again, I, I have to be grateful for the opportunity of being able to visit this island. And that was really cool. But yeah, outside of the preview event, it was just, you know, going to a couple of lunches and dinners and me just biding my time in the hotel room because uh, outside of the preview event, what else can I do? You're in an island. You can't even Uber Eats anything <laughs> because you're on an island. Was we, we got to fucking ferry that shit from Australia? I don't know. Okay, so the event itself was on that Tuesday and it was it was me and a, and a bunch of other gaming press. I think I was the only like YouTuber, content creator in general there because I didn't recognize anybody and I was here all different languages. I heard some German, I heard some French, uh, Italian, uh, Spanish. Uh, I think because everybody else was gaming press like IGN uh, and a lot of other uh, uh, media outlets I never heard of because they're from different countries and all that sort of shit. But I was like, this is weird. I've never been really a part of anything like this. And I felt kind of, uh, I'm gonna be honest, I felt kind of alone being like the only content creator. I was like, oh, what do you do? It's like, you report on games, sure. I was like, what do I do? I, I make fucking YouTube videos, man. <laughs> but you know, it was kind of a, it's kind of an isolated experience, but I, I kind of like being isolated a bit. So it was also kind of welcoming, but uh, they had all of these uh, PC towers set up. Everyone's got their own monitor. So I, we're playing a PC build of the game and they gave us six hours total, uh, including breaks. We had about six hours to play whatever we could with Sonic Frontiers. Uh, they gave us a nice little introductory course uh, to give us an idea, to give us some context of the game itself. Even following the game is like, the, we don't need to hear any of this shit because we already know what's going on. <laughs> Just let them play the fucking game already. And we all sit down, we get our gaming capture stuff ready to go. They tell us what we can record, what we can't record. And there's a few restrictions on that. And I'll elaborate that in a second. The way it was set up is that they had multiple save files for us ready to go so that we can just jump ahead to specific points when they said it was time to go. This essentially means we did not have time to record like the entirety of one island or the other. And uh, we can immediately jump into like the major boss fight of said island, which they did not let us record because they don't want us spoiling that bit. So uh, in regards to what I can't talk about, I can't talk about uh, my experiences with some of the content. I can't talk about the boss fights. I can't, well, the major boss fight anyway. And I can't talk about the story, but that's fine because I wouldn't want to share that stuff with you guys anyway for a first impressions video, because I know a lot of you are probably you, know, you guys can't wait to sink your teeth into this game yourself. Why would I spoil that for you? <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to talk about like my first impressions on what I liked and didn't like about the game, but the, the, the real meat and potatoes of it, I really think you should experience that yourself. And if you happen to be watching this video and you really don't want to get spoiled on that, I heavily recommend you stop watching now because uh, there are some things I want to talk about and I can't control what comes out of my mouth sometimes and I might say something I regret. <laughs> but again, I will respect the guidelines and all that uh, to the best of my ability. Uh, or otherwise I probably won't get another trip to Hawaii ever again. So the first thing first that I wanted to touch upon without getting into the story cuts, and I want to talk about the mood of the game. The one thing that caught me off guard immediately, the one thing that was like just apparent right from the get go was just like the the somber mood of this game like this. I wouldn't, call, I wouldn't call it depressing, but it was very moody. Like this is a very moody game that in a way felt like this is what Sonic Forces wanted to be or tried to be maybe yearn to be, I don't know. And I don't know how much of this is just on the general game direction or uh, Ian Flynn. I did interview Ian Flynn uh, the day after the preview event. And obviously he couldn't get into all the details because he too also have to respect, you know, uh, guidelines and that sort of shit. But I think it's kind of half and half. I believe the general direction of the game was a darker story that was from Sega themselves. And Ian Flynn basically had to uh, right around that and man like the contrast from this game to compared to something like sonic colors and generations and all that it's it's night and day it's not even sonic unleash but i feel without getting into the story those that really liked the adventure era you know 
Adventure 1, 2, without it overreaching like with Shadow the Hedgehog and Sonic 06 did, you guys are probably going to enjoy this narrative the most, like out of everything else. And well, I'm not allowed to show cutscenes. And because of that, I decided to skip a lot of them because I figured, well, I'm not going to be showing them anyway. There's no point. And I'll get the proper context and such when I get the game for myself when it releases in a couple of weeks. But uh, every once in a while, I'll catch glimmers and I'm captivated by what's happening. I was like, oh, I really wish I had to get those cutscenes. But that's great. Like, I am legitimately uh, interested in what's happening on the screen. And, and it's not in an ironic sense. Like, I want to see how the story unfolds. I'm... I'm stimulated. I want to see where this goes. And I can't say I've said that for a Sonic story in a very long time. So here's hoping. So everyone gets started with the game and uh, they gave us two options to play. There's the action oriented style for beginners and the high speed style for those that you know, likely played a boost formula game since Unleashed and all that. Uh, I was curious to see what they meant by action style uh, to see how they would introduce a Sonic game to those who never played a Sonic game. In a game like this where you have so much to explore, what did action style present? What did that convey? And the answer was cutting Sonic's speed in half and making him slow as shit. <laughs> okay, he's not Mario slow, he's not Zelda slow. I know Breath of the Wild is often brought up as a comparison for this game, and you know, for good reason. But if you played Sonic games beforehand, he is just a little too slow to the point of almost being unbearable. And I spent most of my playtime on the first island with this style, completely forgetting that you can go into the options at any time and set your high speed back to normal or maybe a little above and beyond if you really want to bring Sonic back to what you know from like the, the, the boost era. And I wish I did that sooner. I did that starting with like the second island and beyond, but I really wish I did that sooner because my God, like you're still getting involved in a lot of high speed antics. You, you're, you're grinding on rails. You are bouncing off springs. You are wall jumping. You are climbing mountains, all, all sorts of terrain in a speed greater than, you know, your average platformer hero. But man, it was, whew, God, <laughs> I can't get these speed upgrades soon enough. And uh, I, I went out of my way to get a few of them because I got to speed things up. Again, this is all because I did not know or forget that you can go into the option to change the high speed anytime. So if anything, I would recommend, even if you're, even if this is your first time playing the game, you go for the high speed style, because it's not as if you have to be going fast at all times. You don't have to hit the boost button at all times. You can take your time just by leisurely strolling because Sonic Sonic, his leisurely stroll is still a fucking jog compared to everybody else. And you, you're still going to get to areas uh, faster than your, your average platformer. If it's not by boosting, you can do the drop dash, which I, I really enjoyed doing because I found that to be like the best way to climb mountains and all that sort of thing. Muscle memory though, I gotta tell you, fucked me so hard because in this game, uh, first off, the homing attack is back on the side buttons. It, and for Xbox equivalent, they put it back on the X button. Those playing Sonic Unleashed know exactly what I'm talking about. I hate it. <laughs> I adjusted to it because I, got, I had to go back into the Sonic Unleashed mentality, but Man, uh, they, they they put the homing attack back on the X button. Uh, and I think maybe that was because to, to supplement the Sonic's double jump, he does have a double jump once again in this. Uh, very similar to colors and forces. Uh, I liked it. I think my biggest concern with it is your forward momentum being too strong on the second jump. And when you're doing precise platforming, that can screw you more than anything, which kind of goes against the nature of a double jump for me, because uh, a double jump to me is a, is a corrective jump. You use it to correct yourself. But if you are being propelled further than when you anticipate just by doing the double jump, the double jump itself, uh, it, it, it can cause you to slip up and fall. And that happened to me uh, more times than I was comfortable to admit. And I had to rely on the stomp to get myself to stop right where I wanted to, otherwise I was careening off of the platform. Not the end of the world, but it was a, a problem that I, I didn't notice. Another thing from muscle memory, they put the boost on the right trigger. I guess it's in line with maybe like a race car like experience or a driving simulator. The boost being on the right trigger, I got it to, that fucked with me so much because you're doing boost gameplay, but you can't exactly drift like you could in Unleashed and in Generations and Colors and Forces. And I gotta tell you, sometimes I feel the control style conflicted with itself because 
there are times where uh, you have to boost along the, uh, a straight edge, uh, well, a straight line, and you can still do like the quick step left and right. You can either use the analog stick or you can use the bumpers if you're, you're true to that. I, I'm, I personally like using the bumpers because I like the feedback on that more than the analog stick. I feel the analog stick is maybe a little too sensitive for that. And I'll, I'll, I'll shift left and right when I didn't mean to. But having to hold the boost on the right trigger and then having to shift my fingers to quick step with the L and R shoulder buttons did not feel good. And I'm hoping this is something that we can fix in like the options menu because when I went to the uh, options, I noticed the controls were locked on the controller, but you can change them on the keyboard or mouse if you wanted to play it that way. And I'm hoping in the final release, or maybe it was in the release, I just wasn't, I'm just ignorant to it, that you can change it to your liking because it, it didn't feel good. And I didn't really have this problem in uh, earlier boost games. Oh, I just realized I forgot to fucking start the video by wearing like complimentary giant anal beads that they gave me when I checked in at the hotel. Got a nice little uh, Sonic Frontiers thing. <laughs> I don't know what you'd call this, the name tag. You can put your name and your telephone number. Not for sale. I'm gonna put this on eBay. I don't know. I'm kidding. I'm, not, I'm gonna keep it for myself because this is memorabilia, dude. This is what you, this is what you hold on to the most outside of the giant anal beads. So the core gameplay. What did I think of it? Well, short and to the point, I'm optimistic of the full release. I enjoyed what I played. I think this sort of formula, where you just let Sonic go to town on these humongous islands with your high speed, the usual antics that you can do in the other games, you just go at it. I, I enjoyed myself because I love that sense of freedom. One of my preliminary concerns, which unfortunately was made true while playing it, was the direction, the, the repetition of it, because this game is all about collecting a lot of knickknacks. The main purpose of the island is to collect the seven chaos emeralds. How do you collect the chaos emeralds? You got to collect vault keys. How do you get vault keys? You have to play cyber stages. Uh, how do you play cyber stages? You have to collect portal gears. How do you get portal gears? You have to fight enemies or you can find them uh, under certain areas of the map. And that, that's something I actually really liked and I'm hoping that it's further emphasized in the full release. You don't necessarily have to adhere to a linear formula to gain access, to, to eventually gain access to the Chaos Emerald in question. Because the Vault Keys that go back, you mainly get those through the Cyber Stages. You, you get one just by completing the stage, but you can get extra ones by completing certain objectives in the stage. But getting all the red rings, clearing under a certain time, getting a good number of rings, it's like completing different missions in like the adventure games and what have you. You should be pretty familiar with how that works. That is how you're supposed to get a lot of Vault Keys at once, and it still is like the best way to get it. But if you really don't want to, if you love just exploring the lands at all willy-nilly at your leisure, you can find a lot of these collectibles just by running into them. I found a few Volt Keys just by playing the game normally, and I really like that. And that goes for a lot of other collectibles. Uh, the portal gears, which you mainly get from enemies, but you can also just find those by exploring. Uh, another thing about the game is uh, rescuing your friends, and you do that by collecting enough of these uh, character-specific collectibles like with amy it's uh, these hearts with tails it's these wrenches and what have you it, okay it's tied to the, the character in question that you're rescuing and you got to collect a lot of these uh to progress with the game now if you have a good eye for it if you if you got a good knack for platforming there are some challenges on the island itself that reward you with maybe like 10 12 emblems at a time and those that that felt really good. A lot of other times, though, you are doing a very quick obstacle course and you're rewarded with one emblem. And man, I thought whew, this needed to be tuned because there are times where you are you are locked behind getting a certain number of emblems. And after a while, fatigue started to set in. And uh, I was hoping that wouldn't be the case. But again, they gave us close to six hours of game time for this one. And though we were jumping ahead, uh, thanks to these pre-made save files they made for us so we can explore different islands, my main concern was the repetition of it. Am I going to see everything the game delivers by the first island? And then it's just a matter of doing it again and again with a different coat of paint of the different islands in this case. And it's too early for me to say, but regardless, I did grow tired after maybe an hour and a half 
close to two hours, I was getting a little fatigued. Uh, doing these miniature obstacle courses, uh, fighting enemies especially, I got a little tired of. Uh, especially like early on, like fighting enemies is almost as bad, I want to say, as Shadow in 06. You know, because he had a homing attack that you, you zoom in on an enemy and you mash the fuck out of the attack button. And that was combat. In the beginning of the game, it's about as bad as that. Thankfully, it doesn't take very long for you to start getting your first set of skill points and you can go into the skill tree uh, to unlock different abilities, which slowly adds more to your combo. Not much at first. Their idea of uh, intricate combat is just adding one extra button to the combo to watch Sonic do something flashy and then the enemy dies all the same. The combat itself did eventually become more gratifying. I, I love the parry. You can like guard or block enemy attacks and swoop in for a counter attack. And that honest to God felt good. You even get like a bullet time in Bayonetta where you, you just go ham and enemies die lickety split. But regardless, you're doing that a lot. And the formula doesn't really veer away from that. From my first impressions, I have to stress all this is just first impressions, so by the main game, my opinion on this could very much change, but from what I was given, I was getting a little tired of it. And some enemies just weren't that fun to fight. Uh, until you get like the sonic boom attack, that's where Sonic like launches all these projectiles at an enemy. Uh, one enemy in particular that's surrounded by all these balls it's almost impossible to defeat with just regular means. You have to wait until you get this upgrade to reliably uh, attack them. Uh, some enemies are uh, guard instantaneously. You have to do the psych loop for the, the, the not paralooping mechanic from nights into dreams. And sometimes it's fun. Other times it's an added step to what should be a simple encounter. And I think my biggest takeaway from frontiers core gameplay is this is something I don't think you should marathon. You play this in spurts. Like you play this maybe an hour and a half at a time. Don't marathon this because it is a lot of busy work. And I was I was expecting the game to be like that. Uh, I, re I recall uh, talking about it uh, a bit behind the scenes. I said this was Sonic from Ubisoft. And so I was like, ooh. <laughs> but it was more like, it's what I immediately think of when I think of open world stuff that has a lot of things, a lot of activities for you to do to slowly start collecting these knickknacks and make your way to the mission objective. You beat the mission objective and you head off to the next area to do it all over again. Functionally, everything works. I love the way Sonic controls in this. I love eventually upgrading all my stuff to do all these really flashy moves. Again, combat does get more gratifying when you start unlocking all these like extra sweet special moves and things die lickety split. I could have gone with some enemies not forcibly changing the camera angle when I'm running past it. There's one enemy in particular that immediately takes off to the sky and releases all these small bots and you have to homing attack chain them. Just approaching this dude causes him to jump up in the air and the camera, whether you like it or not, hard locks onto him and there's nothing you can do about that. So even if you're just trying to ignore it, you suddenly can't see anything ahead of you. And I hate when camera control is forcibly ripped away from me like that. Probably the most enjoyable parts of the combat was fighting like the larger than normal. I'm blanking on the name of them, but those guys were really fun to fight. I felt these took advantage of the combat the best. And it was a, it was an excellent test of reflexes and skill to bypass their attacks, look for the opening and then just go to town. I thought those were probably the best part of the combat uh, outside of the things that I can't talk about. Uh, and I can't, I wish I could, but I can't. But I can say, uh, I if you liked Metal Gear Revengeance, the atmosphere, the tone of those boss fights, I think you're really gonna like them here. Uh, hell, I don't, even, I don't even know why I had to say Revengeance because hell, those that liked how boss fights were handled in Adventure 1 and 2 were really gonna like these boss fights. And uh, it was the best part of the game for me. I wish I could talk about it, but I cannot gonna have to wait until the full release and my full video on it. Cyber stages are also a big part of uh, island exploration. And after you collect the uh, the prerequisite amount of portal gears, you can uh, enter them. And uh, these are essentially, it's a number of things. They take level bits from like generations and such, and you just go through them like you would a traditional boost era Sonic game. So if you love it, uh, Unleashed Colors and Forces, uh, these are right up your alley. And 
I'm of two minds with these. One, it makes sense in the story for Sonic to be running through bits and pieces of stages he's already done before, like the Generations thing. I also find it a little cheap, uh, to be perfectly honest, because uh, as someone who goes back and plays the older games, these are still kind of fresh in my head, and uh, repeatedly, I'm going through these chunks, like this is from Green Hill Generations, that's from Sky Sanctuary, that's this this part of Chemical Plant is ripped wholesale from this part of the uh, earlier games. These stages are really short, so it's not enough to really grate on the nerves, but I, I do have to wonder if this is going to be the entire game. However, and maybe this is the silver lining on it, it's not just Generations that it pulls from, uh, to my surprise. Because uh, one Cyber did in particular, uh, it started with me very high in the sky, and I'm grinding down rails, I launch out, and I'm like, huh, that reminded me of something. Then I take a few steps forward, and I see these familiar spring and enemy formations, I was like, this is Skyrail from Sonic Adventure 2. And then it hit me, I was like, oh shit, they're, they're pulling from all the 3D Sonic games. At least that's what I think they're gonna do. Uh, I'm not, it remains to be seen, but there were a couple of cyber stages that were levels from th other 3D Sonic games. And that's exciting, because you know, it's not just generation stuff. It's that, that was my main concern, was like, they're just gonna pull from the boost era stuff and we're gonna be playing a bunch of stuff that we already played before. And you can argue, yeah, that, that's still the case no matter what era they pull from, but it, it does enough to uh, freshen up things. Unfortunately, and again, this is something I'm hoping that is just something that we encounter in the earlier uh, islands. This game only has, I think, three level aesthetics for cyber stages. Green Hill, Sky Sanctuary, and Chemical Plant. And it just switches between those three a lot for all the cyber... And I played a lot of cyber stages, uh, just to be up front. It never switched out of those three level themes. And visually, I thought it was pretty repetitive. And I'm hoping in the full release it's more than that, because I could be playing remix stages of all these other games as much as I want, but visually I'm gonna get tired of Green Hill, Sky Sanctuary, and Chemical Plant. I'm hoping that this is not the case, but at the same time, uh, to go back to what I said, these stages are very small. They're very short. They're, they're not the meat and potatoes of Sonic Frontiers. That is the island exploration. And that in itself, considering the humongous size of these islands and how fast Sonic can travel through them, completing all sorts of mission objectives, getting things done, finding these uh, upgrades to his health, his defense, his speed, his, his ring quota. He gets so many rings in this game. That is the meat and potatoes of Frontiers. And in that regard, that's why I'm optimistic about it. Yes, it is repetitious, it is something that is going to test my patience a big time, especially if I eventually at one point decide to 100% this game, whatever that entails, but I did enjoy myself with the time I had with it. And I really want to see more of the story. I want to see the other boss fights because those were so good and I can't tell you about them, but man, I'm looking forward to this. I mean, regardless, if I'm, I'm getting a paycheck anyway by reviewing the game, <laughs> but I want to enjoy myself, you know? I don't want to... I don't want to approach these games with a cynical viewpoint. I was like, oh boy, I was like, here's another 3D Sonic game. But yeah, man, it's, a, it's another 3D Sonic game. It's been, it's been five years since Forces. And, you know, that was Forces. And yeah, I think I'm going to enjoy myself with this. I just hope that all of my initial concerns were just preliminary concerns. You know, I hope they don't take up my entire headspace for the remainder of the adventure. I, I hope. It's not, <laughs> because uh, <oof. laughs> I did grow a little tired, I'm not gonna lie. I also had the opportunity to interview Takashi Izuka Sonic Team. It was very impromptu. I had no questions ready for the guy, and there was a bit of a language barrier. Thankfully, he had his translator with him, and that was really fun. Like, I, I never really got to interview a game developer, especially one from a different country, and I hear his uh, thoughts and such, like, translated in real time. Like, it was a very, it was a very, interesting experience and I'm glad to have experienced that. So I think to uh, cap off this video, I will leave you guys with uh, my small interview with Takashi Izuka. Don't get too excited because I know that he can't share all the details of Frontiers. I figured don't waste his time asking him questions he clearly cannot answer. So I, those are expecting him to like slip up and give us the deets on the juicy bits on this and that. Don't. 
I kept things very generalized because I don't know if I'm ever going to have the chance to talk to this guy again. I just wanted to have some fun. So, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope Sonic Frontiers knocks it out of the park. I want it to be good. And so far, I I'm liking what I see. But we'll know for sure in a couple of weeks when the game goes live. Well, with all that said, I'll leave you to the interview and thank you all for watching. Stay safe out there. Take care of yourselves and each other. Have yourselves a fantastic night. And take care. <laughs> it is hard. You take all the time you want. I don't care. Yeah, I was working on only Sonic and Knights. Okay. Yeah, so I created only two brands. So, so my uh, most favorite Sonic title is Sonic Adventure 2. Yeah, th this is most enjoyable to play to create the game. Yeah, that's most memorable. Do you like Adventure 2 more than Adventure 1? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got it on tape. Loves Adventure 2 more than Adventure 1. More fuel for the fire. As a game designer, we're always trying to make something new. That's kind of like the, the goal of what we want to do is create new content and new experiences. However, not everyone wants something new. So this is where it gets difficult is they want to create something new but they need to create something for people that maybe want something familiar and maybe want something more like what they already had. So it's trying to think of an idea that's going to get those new audiences that want a new experience excited about the content, but also keep the people who want more of the same to still feel excited about this new content that they're creating. And it's that, that like ideation and creative uh, challenge that the development team, everyone on the develop, you know, uh, development team always has when creating games. Speaking as a long time Sonic fan, Sonic fans are fickle and don't know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the linear gameplay for them started with the Sonic Adventure series, where you're constantly kind of following this path from start to finish to get to you know the end or the goal. Um, so for them, like that whole linear series, uh, whether you could boost or not, started there. They've been doing it for well, a couple decades now, uh, and they really felt like game users, their preference and their taste has kind of shifted over the years, and they needed to kind of shift the gameplay they were creating to appeal to the current kind of gaming audience. Um, so what started as like the pixel, you know, original Sonic the Hedgehog, I'm sure you and I played uh, a lot uh, originally. That's good, like that first generation, they really consider like the pixel uh, generation. Uh, from there, they go into the linear generation with Sonic Adventure. And with Sonic Frontiers, they're taking it to like the third generation. This is really the open zone format that they're talking about. Uh, and it's allowing freedom for the players to kind of run around and do whatever they want without having to be told, like, go from point A to point B as fast as you can. So for them, that's really, you know, what they're doing with this new new concept and this new format is to appeal to the new audience that's going to appreciate that kind of gameplay more than the more linear format uh, previously. What do you like about Sonic? Uh, the hedgehog for you to stay with him for so long besides it being your job and you don't want to get fired <laughs> <laughs> so yeah when he joined uh sega and started working on the sonic franchise it was a sonic 3 you know this is still very early in kind of the character's development uh popular character but for them it was really you know at sonic 3 and even beyond is where are we going to take this character and how are we going to like kind of build and grow this character from here on out um, and that's really, I think, where uh, a lot of things started getting interesting is, you know, as a team, they said, you know, what are we going to do for Sonic the Hedgehog? What kind of games are we going to make? What kind of characters uh, are we going to add? What stories are we going to tell? Um, and it's really expanding on the character and kind of growing the character from Sonic 3 that Isaac's son really uh, enjoyed. You know, whether it's you know, the Sonic Adventure series and having, you know, cutscenes and all these interesting things that you could do to you know, what they're doing now with the movie, with the comic books, with the Netflix series. Uh, it's being able to you know, be there at the early uh, development stages of the character and grow that character for the past you know, 10, 20 years, uh, 30 years now, that isaac -san really finds most satisfying. And he, you know, probably a lot of people on the team really you know, enjoyed being there and experiencing that with the, uh, 
with everyone. It's the journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's okay. taking the journey with yeah. the character, expanding on the lore, you know, having the characters, uh, you know, really grow. <laughs> Some of the perks, yes. <laughs> So yeah, advice that's very tough, uh, you know, and this is me being Izuxan. I don't think I'm the best game designer out there, uh, so it's it's hard to uh, give you know very specific advice. But for me, a game designer is someone who kind of creates a fun world and creates the the fun experience for people to have in that world. Uh, so it's really you know from the very get go, being able to imagine fun and figure out. What that fun experience is going to be for the player uh, is very important. And then once you understand what that fun thing is, working with your team to execute on creating and really developing and delivering that fun experience to the end user. Um, and making games is very tough. It's not, <laughs> it's not an easy job. And there's lots of uh, work that needs to put into it. But at the end of the day, if you can constantly remind yourself that I'm making something fun, and this is going to be a fun experience for other people. Uh, that will hopefully get people through that creative process. All right, so I like one more thing. Uh, this is more of a personal <laughs> request. Yeah. Uh, would you sign my copy? Of <laughs> sure. Your All least right. favorite Sonic. <laughs> <laughs>